have time. Oh, it's a double! It's a double! Oh, wow! Check it out! <laughs> Hey there folks, welcome back to Cambo Trout Fishing. Now what I'm going to have for you this time around is actually kind of special, I haven't done it before. And that's where I'm going to do a three part series. Number one is going to be how I prepared for the fishing trip. Number two is going to be the majority of the fishing trip. And number three is actually going to be the end of the fishing trip because I don't want to get too much away, but that last part was enough to make it its own video and then some. So here's how it's going to break down. The first thing I'm going to show you are the tools and all the gear, the knots, the line, different web services, everything I use to scout and prepare for my fishing trip. So that'll be episode one where I show you everything that went into making my trip a success. Second episode, like I said, is going to get into the actual fishing at three of the locations I went on this day. I actually went to a total of four and you'll see how all that plays out. And of course, the third part will be that fourth spot that I visited. And did pretty well. <laughs> so to kick things off, here's an order that I generally go in when I'm planning a trip. One is checking out the conditions because the conditions dictate big time. Not only whether or not you can go fishing, whether or not it's worth your time, but especially what species are going to be available for you to target. That's the first thing I do is go and I check the weather forecast, see what the wind's going to be, what temperature is going to be, air and water. The water clarity, is it gonna rain beforehand? Is it gonna rain after? Cold front, warm front, prior to, afterward, on the single day, all that matters. And here are the resources that I use to find that information. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so the first thing that I would look at would be a general weather service. This will give you the 10 day forecast for whatever area you're looking at. And I particularly pay attention to the preceding week of weather, as well as what is scheduled to come after it. There's things in there like, there's a low pressure system getting ready to move in. How cold was it before you went out? In this case, on this day, I checked and I knew, and I had been living it, that it was very cold. I was able to look out back and I could see the water was frozen in a lot of these creeks and a lot of these ponds and lakes. So I knew that was gonna have a big factor on where I went. But aside from just the general weather service, you also have things like Windy app here. And this is really important because wind forecasts for the general populace really aren't that accurate when it comes to how much water, excuse me, when it comes to how much wind you're going to encounter on the water, because there's nothing to obstruct the flow of wind on the water. A lot of times you can add another 50 to 100% in terms of the wind strength in the forecast between the land and the water. So find a good app or a good program like Windy app here and make sure you use that for the location you're looking at going to. Now, in the case of this day right here, I was planning this day a little more than two weeks out because I had to look at getting time off to actually get out there on the water. But when I went and I found, and I was scouting and looking at which day I wanted to choose, that's when I saw one day had light and variable wind. And that's the best wind forecast you can get. So that is the day I put in for. What else that forecast tells me is that because the wind is lower, that means bigger water is now open to me as a kayak fisherman. Because if it's gonna be windy, I will stay off big water. It gets too dangerous, too dicey. But if the wind is hardly there at all, I will definitely take a chance on bigger water. And you'll see how that plays into episode three of the series. The next one I'll show you, and the last one for right now, is gonna be the USGS water monitor sites. They are able to track the flow and other information about various bodies of water, especially rivers and creeks from all around the country. And just as an example right here, this is for the Rappahannock River down in Virginia, where we'll actually be having our fourth cleanup meetup, along with some fishing meetup out there. <laughs> but anyway, after you find the particular station you want to check in, in this case, the Rappahannock River near Fredericksburg, you come down here, set your date parameters for the period of time you want to look at. And once you have, depending on the water station, because some measure different parameters than others, this one has the temperature, discharge, gauge height, even conductance dissolved oxygen. But the one that I generally look at most often is turbidity because that's your water clarity. So if I can know what the clarity has been or will be when I'm going out there, that's a huge factor for me in terms of selecting the lures and techniques I plan to use. 
Okay, so now we've looked at the conditions themselves and we're ready to identify what species we want to chase. In my position, where I am at, here in Maryland, this time of year, you're pretty much limited to cold water fisheries. Those include things like blue catfish, yellow perch, sometimes white perch the right time of year, chain pickerel, walleye, trout. There are some options out there. But on this particular day, after looking at all the conditions and remembering that I'm in the CC tournament still that's opened through the end of February, I decided to go for perch and pickerel, specifically yellow perch and pickerel. So what did I do? I then went to use these tools to determine which spots I would like to go. So one thing I haven't mentioned yet that's actually really important in terms of site selection is that I also used the weather condition app to determine where I want to go because I knew that I'd be dealing with a lot of hard water. A lot of the lakes, the ponds that I wanted to fish were gonna be frozen. That's just the way it was. But I could find places to fish by finding moving water. And where could I find moving water for perch and pickerel? One of the best places is spillways because they're constantly moving and that constantly moving water prevents it from freezing. And I was hopeful just a little bit <laughs> that maybe some of those ponds feeding those spillways would have enough ice off the water by the afternoon for me to launch my kayak. And lastly, I selected my fourth and final location because it was big water. And I knew the wind forecast was low, so I wasn't worried about it. And I knew for a fact that that big water was iced out because I checked with a few buddies before I went up there. But anyway, if you were looking for tools to find some fishing locations, a few tools you can use include Fishbrain. Now, Fishbrain is a controversial tool, but there's no denying that once you download it, I use it on my mobile phone, on my mobile app, it can show you so many places to fish that it's incredible. You can search by species and many other parameters. Another great resource is Fish Talk Magazine. They have some great contributors and tons of information about fishing the Delmarva area. So if you haven't yet, definitely check out Fish Talk Magazine. And the last one I would hit, is going to be the actual Maryland Fishing Report. The Maryland DNR puts out a weekly fishing report that provides you information on saltwater and freshwater fishing from the top of the bay in Maryland all the way down south. Another excellent resource that you really want to familiarize yourself with to find out what's going on out there on the water. And of course, another one would be various Facebook groups. Do a quick search for them on your body of water and you might just find a group dedicated to the type of fish or the areas you want to fish. All right, so now I've checked weather conditions and I know what species I want to chase. And I've chosen that species because I think they'll have the best chance of having me be successful out there. And again, to circle back, the reason that I chose those species is because I know locations I can go to, despite the fact that it's been so cold, because I know they have spillways. Spillways are constantly moving water. They keep the water from freezing. So I know that even if the lakes are frozen, I'm still gonna have areas that I can fish. So. Next thing I did was plan out my route. And that's important for several reasons. One is that you can provide a travel plan for yourself, especially if you're out there alone, to your wife in my case, or anyone else you wanna have a bead on where you're at. That way, if you don't show up when you're supposed to, someone can raise an alarm bell and make sure you're all right. So that's the next thing I did was identify what my path was gonna be. And I decided that I was gonna cross over the Bay Bridge from the west side to the east side, and then essentially do a circle up around the bay until I got to my fourth spot. Now, if I had gotten to any of those spots and had just a completely fire bite, I would not have left it. As it was, I still did really well, especially for the winter, and you'll see it on here. But I did make it to all four spots eventually, even if I didn't have much time with the last spot. But anyway, we looked at the weather, identified what species we want to chase, and now I know what locations I'm gonna to go to. I provided my travel plan to my wife, now I'm ready to actually start playing with my gear. And this is where you're gonna go through all of your gear. You're gonna go through your tackle boxes, identify what lures you do need to bring, which ones you don't need to bring. And I'm not gonna lie, it was really difficult for me to take the top water and the top water frogs out of my, you know, milk crate, out of my backpack, out of my cases. I kept trying to say to myself, well, what if, and then I had to be like, no, no, it's not gonna happen. That's not what you're going for. Like, but maybe, no, the lakes are probably frozen over. You don't need top water right now. Eventually, I think I made what was the mature decision and got rid of everything except what I needed for perch and pickerel. So now let's look at the gear that I used, the way I rigged it up, and what I packed with me. So if you watch my videos, I, I get a lot of 
flack for this sometimes, but I literally wear my flotation vest pretty much all the time. Even if I'm fishing from shore, I wear this thing. Part of it is because of safety. The other part of it is because this particular XPS brand fishing flotation vest right here has pockets on it for quick access to a few choice cases that you want to have on you. And in the case that I had on me, I had various pickerel lures, I had crappy and perch lures, I had, as far as swim baits go, I wanted to have a few of those handy on me in case I needed to throw them, in case I thought it would be really good. And the same thing goes for chatter baits and other similar type lures. The point being that those lures that I think I'm going to use a lot, that I might reach for first, I want to have very near to me so I don't have to stop what I'm doing, go rifle through my gear, it's wasting time. You want to prioritize, and it's a tough decision sometimes, but you want to prioritize what you put in these little cases like this within your vest or with whatever you keep on your person. Prioritize, make the tough decisions, and remember what species you're targeting, you'll probably be okay. Also on my vest, I have an emergency whistle in the event I need to use it. And if you're on the water, you can actually get ticketed for not having one of these, so definitely get one of those. I also have my casking pliers, again, from my buddy Peter. Thanks very much, dude. There's these little cutters on there. You can see them in front of my hat right now. Gosh, they come in handy. I mean, pliers, of course, come in handy, but these little cutters. I love when you can have multi-uses out of a tool. It's less gear you have to bring in total, less weight, etc., etc. And the other things that I keep in my vest, just so you all are aware, I'll keep some floats in here in case I want to suspend a jig or something like that. I keep spare hooks in here, some limited degree of terminal tackle, and that again keeps me from having to rifle through my gear to an extreme extent. Now, the last note that I want to make on here is where I'm going to start getting into explaining to you how I tied my hooks on, because it is an important point. And the way I did it, in this case, there were two different fashions. First, I'll show you the pickerel rig, or the straight live bait rig. And to do that, what I did was I took one aught gamagatsu circle hooks. And what I did, in terms of tying these up, is I prepared, and put this in front of my head so you can see it clearly. What I did was I took about, I would say two feet, maybe a maximum of three feet of this 10 pound fluorocarbon. And I attached it to this one aught circle hook using a knotless snell. And that knotless snell knot, if you're looking for a great example of how to tie it, I will link to my buddy and fellow teammate, Brandon's channel, 410 Commando. He's the one who keyed me on to making sure you always use a knot with snow when you're dealing with circle hooks because it greatly increases your hookup ratio. But the reason I have so many of these tied on pre-rig is that I don't want to have to take time to tie things on on the water any more than I absolutely have to. So I keep these on me so I'm prepared. And if you stay prepared, you'll save yourself a lot of time and maximize your fishing time on the water. So that was one particular rig that I kept on me in three stage. I also have some jig heads and shad darts on me. But the next thing I want to show you is the actual rig I was using that I was catching a lot of fish on, be it perch, pickerel, or crappy. So I'm gonna go grab that. So if you've been following my channel, and especially if you're into perch and crappy fishing, you've probably seen by now my favorite yellow perch rig video. If not, I'll, I'll make sure I leave something up here that'll link it back to it. But that goes through the basic setup of what I use for my perch and crappy fishing. And what that is, it's going to start up top, usually with either a shad dart or a small jig. And by small, I mean 1 16th or smaller. That'll be up top on a dropper loop. Six to eight inches down, I will have my other jig. Now, in some areas, that's all I'm going to have. And this bottom one will be tied on with a knot like an improved clinch knot or perhaps a palomar. And there won't be a tag in coming off here like you see right now. That'll be the entire rig. I may have a float up top if I want to keep this thing at a certain suspended depth. But you'll see in the videos when I get to the fishing how I was using this to catch pickerel, to catch crappie, to catch perch. But there is one variation that I used in it in the last part of this three-part series and that's because I was perch jerking from deep water. And I'm talking between 20 to 40 feet. To do that, I will actually use two dropper loops and then a space of about 12 inches or a little bit more depending on where I'm at, down to a bunch of weights or a single weight, which then gets this thing down in the water column to the bottom very quickly. Because if you're not familiar, yellow perch generally hang around the bottom. Sometimes they'll suspend 
but by and large, I catch yellow perch on the bottom. And you would need this one hook, two hook, and then finally down to the weights to get it down to where you need it and really start jerking those perch up. And man, I don't want to give way too much, but it was a good time, a really good time. So those are the two basic rigs that I used. So we have the pure live bait rig that was straight up under a float. And then we had this particular rig, which you can call my favorite perch rig <laughs> or the dropper loop rig right here, okay? And again, you have the variation where you can do two dropper loops down to a weight if you're fishing deep water. Now, as far as the gear itself goes, I'm using by and large, either light or ultra light rigs. This right here is, I believe, four pound P line. Okay, it's a great, great line out there. And the reel is rather old, but still gets the job done. That's a Mitchell Avocet 2, and that's a 2000 series reel. Now, I did have some rods out there that use straight braid. Let's discuss that really quickly. There's a few points I wanna to make to you that may save you a lot of trouble. Here's an example of the live bait rig I was telling you about. You can see the one aught circle hook right here attached with a knotless snell to increase that hookup ratio. And this is all on 10 pound fluoro with the float right here. But what I wanna point out to you is this right here. I told you I was using braid, right? It's difficult for you to see. And that's because this knot is just so special. It's so thin, the profile's so thin, it's great. It's called an FG knot. I'll link to a video below for how to tie an FG knot. It's a little daunting at first, but once you get used to it, you memorize, you get that muscle memory, it's the best knot I've found for attaching braid to fluoro or mono. I mean, this thing is extremely thin. It passes out of your guides without issue, and it's very strong. I haven't had one fail on me on a fish, period. So if you want to take out and use even your straight braid rods for this type of winter fishing, I do recommend having one of these mono or fluoro leaders on it. But here's the final caveat. I was lucky this day because I think the high was in the mid 40s or low 50s, really good temperature. I planned this day for a reason. But a lot of times this time of year, especially when we start, and even when I started this day, it was below freezing. And when you're in waters that are below freezing, not only are your guides gonna ice up, but if you're using braid, the braid will retain water and then the entire length of your braid that's exposed to water will freeze up. It makes casting a nightmare. You get knots. I'm pretty sure it damages the braid as well. Point being, if it's gonna be really cold, braid is probably not the way to go as it, it just turns into a nightmare to use. It becomes almost unusable to be honest if it's cold or not. So I would lean towards the fluoro and the mono during those colder months. All right, so what have we discussed? Well, we have discussed the conditions report, looking at the weather to identify what species we wanna chase. Once we identify those species, we look at locations. We select our locations, we plan our route, and provide it to somebody who cares about us so we can make sure that we're home on time and not flipped over in a river somewhere. And now I've shown you the basic gear for it. I guess what I will do is go through and show you a few of the other lures that we're using out here. And I did have some that were rigged up, some lines that were rigged up to use straight lures, like spinners, like chatterbaits. I had those on the straight braid rods, the heavier of the rigs out there. So I really didn't want to lose that gear to a fish that would break me off, you know? So here I have my terminal tackle box that has everything from swim bait hooks to circle hooks, even small crappy jigs, weights. And here, thanks again to my buddy Jared, I'm not gonna tip this all the way over because I don't wanna be picking these up off the floor, but this is a box full of jig heads, shad darts, spinners, all those things you generally associate with perch, crappie, and pickerel fishing. So to say that I was set is an understatement. But what are some other items that you really need to bring out there whenever you're going out this time of year? Try to get hand and foot warmers, super important. Gloves, waterproof clothing, a dry suit, especially if you can afford it. I also have a dip net for my minnow bucket because that helps minimize how much time your hands spend in the water and it'll keep your hands from freezing up because there's nothing worse than having wet hands on a cold windy day. It'll chase you off the water or put you in a really bad situation really quickly. So have a dip net as well. And if you watched my Christmas gifts video, here is the backpack that I ended up taking with me. And again, that is from Wild River. Great little setup. Holds most of my organizational cases right in here. And if I wanted to, I could take this on the kayak with me. If I wasn't on the kayak, I could wear it on my back. And it's very light, very light. It wasn't a burden at all. I was, one time I was actually wearing it and forgot I was wearing it. But I guess the last thing I would say to bring 
would probably be a hand towel because like I said before, you don't want to get your hands wet and you don't want to put wet hands back inside your gloves because that's going to completely kill the warming effect that your gloves have. And this time of year, when you're out there winter fishing, it's really important to take care of yourself. It's always important, but it's especially important this time of year because if something goes wrong, you could be in a bad way really quickly. All right, folks, that really concludes how I prepared for this trip. The next video that you're gonna see that I'm gonna release is gonna be from the first three locations. And you'll see all the fish I caught there, how it played out for me, what I learned, and a lot of tips I'm gonna pass on to you. Hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe, especially share out there, folks. If you think you got a friend who would enjoy it too, send it over to them. It really helps us out on here. Same thing with hitting that like and subscribe button. But anyway, thanks for watching, and you have a good one.